Let's start out by, by telling everybody who you are and what you have to do with Python. Hey, my name is Tal, uh, group leader at SAI. Python, it's uh, what you develop. We all Python. Hey, my name is Oren. I'm uh, director of engineering in VIA. And uh, Python is my day-to-day -day language, basically. Hello, my name is Leo. Working at Bluevine as a group leader, uh, developing in Python for the last uh, 10 years, something like that. Hi, I'm Barak Peleg. I'm the VP Engineering at A21 Labs and um, been using Python uh, for the past 10 years or so. Hi, I'm Miki Tebeka, uh, independent teacher and consultant, uh, shipping bugs with Python for 25 years now. Hi, I'm Oit Wasserman. I'm a legal software architect at Red Hat, and we use Python extensively. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a group leader at Mobileye. I've been reading logs created by Python for the past decade and doing mostly Python. So I've been programming Python since 1997. Uh, so I know a lot of the tricks that we're going to ask them if they know how to import different things. But let's start out with a, a basic question that everybody in the audience wants to know. Are any of you still using Python 2? None of you. We still have like legacy systems that are running in production and uh, have Python 2.7 in them, and uh, like we figure out that the way to to migrate out of it is just to deprecate the systems gradually instead of migrating them to Python 3. And it's taking a while, but uh, we have a sort of a deadline, an internal deadline for that. Do you think you're actually going to ever completely be off of Python 2? Yeah, like it, it's really like one gigantic monolith, and uh, it's we, we can see it slowly dying. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, what areas are you using Python in your organization? Like anything specifically? Tal, do you want to start? Basically, all development is in Python, except some tools that we internally develop in other languages, but all of uh, what we do is Python. So I think most of our like business logic is in Python. Some of our DevOps-related scripting is in Python. Um, that's pretty much it. Like even server rendered uh, front ends are uh, essentially in Python. You're not doing all of your data science in Python? Yeah, definitely. We also have data science and that's in Python too. Uh, pretty much everywhere you go, we have like, I, I, let's say 95 to 99% of the code is in, actually in Python. Uh, we have some Java applications and, and some Go, but most of them are in Python. In uh, Blue, Bluevine is a Python shop. Basically, every tool, data science, pipelines, backend, everything in Python. Yeah, so I'll say something similar maybe, but in AI21 Labs, the, so the default is Python, and we're using it uh, across the board in the engineering and the data science and algorithms uh, groups, both in the... Um, uh, web services, the uh, data pipelines, ML engineering, uh, and uh, in our dev tooling. So I can talk for the clients I've seen. So uh, definitely data science, data pipelines, and other things, but anything from testing robots to uh, cyber and everything in the middle. Well, we are a bit different. I'm coming from storage. So we use uh, Python for management and our CI and some of the DevOps tools are in Python. So at Mobileye, we really leverage the, the fact that Python is a multi-purpose language. The R&D is a, a big in the Israeli standards, over 1,200 developers. And you can see Python all over the board, data engineering, data science, machine learning, uh, some plain old uh, uh, web services. So. Probably 90% of the code is written in Python, maybe except what is being compiled into the, to the vehicles themselves at the end. All right, Michael, let's, let's continue with you here. In what use cases would you not use Python? You know, obviously if you're uh, developing cars, if they're driving 100 miles per hour and you need to get information into your cars, is Python the best language for that? Probably not, um, but again, Python, I think that the only, at mobile, the only use case we won't use Python is something that has to be compiled into to the vehicle, to the chips, to the hardware. 
this is where we really need the sub millisecond uh, response time. And this is where Python is still not the, the proper language, but it's getting there. Maybe in the future we'll have flying autonomous vehicles running Python. So that's an option. All right, Orit, when would you not use Python? Well, yeah, as I said, we are storage, so all the data path is written in C++, kernel code is in C, of course, and our product is running in Kubernetes, so anything related to Kubernetes operators are written in Go. All right, Mickey, we're gonna change the question for you, right, because we know that you're a Go person. Why do you think that Go is better than Python? Uh, I don't think it's better. I think languages are tools, and every language has its own domain. So in some, py some areas, Python excels more, in some areas, Go excels more, depending on what you need to know. Thank you. All right, back to the original question. You can say, <laughs> what use cases would you not use Python for? Yeah, so AI 20 Labs is a uh, software as a service, and um, in all our sort of uh, uh, client-side browser, client-side, uh, things obviously Python isn't suitable and in that sense uh, also the environment around it I would say uh, the end-to-end -end testing we prefer to, to do things that are more native in that sense Yeah, I will say something personal uh, When talking about Python and that it's slow and stuff like that most of the times It's wrong. It's like saying that uh, we use uh, microservices, you know Half of the people don't know really what is uh, microservices and what is the real structure and everything. Uh, if you are not working in a, in a real real time processes and stuff like that, probably Python is most is fast enough. It's more uh, design and how you do write it more simply and stuff like that. Uh, in Bluevine specifically, everything that is not a uh, front end, we use just Python. Cool, so uh, I think that in some of our teams that are mainly front end and do have some back end, it's easier for the developers to use TypeScript for both. So that's one use case when we're not, when we're not using Python. And we do have several components that are like near real time when we need to solve all kinds of algorithms pretty quickly. Um, so the go-to languages there are like C++ and Java, um, but those are really like isolated components in the system. Most, most use cases we do use Python, and uh, as you just said, it's not slow. Like it's depend it depends how you use it. It's like if you use a hammer to like screw a screw, right? Mm -hmm. it, it won't work well. So figure out how to use it right and it will. Okay, in our case, uh, we think that don't force a language to be something it's not. Don't use uh, Python for low level. Use it for what is doing good. We're doing web services, we're doing py uh, data science. We find that Python is fit for all except front end. They say that uh, that's the only case that we don't use Python. And the only case, in other case that we don't use Python is some uh, components that requires other languages that it's not supported by Python, but you need to use them. That's the only cases that we can see. That's a great point, Python in the front end. I remember a few years ago, I built uh, a, a bunch of data components in Python using WX widgets, and it was ugly as sin. So I don't uh, recommend doing that. Uh, next question is a great question for you, Tal. Um, do you see Python as being more susceptible to security issues than other languages? Yeah. Most of you know that intelligence uh, forces used it in Python rather than uh, communication that used in C Sharp. Uh, we found that uh, most of the Python uh, web frameworks is more secure than others. I use Rails before, I use ASP.NET, now we're using Django. We see that Django is much secure than other. Uh, the security aspect in Python is more crucial than other languages, and we see it in day-to-day -day work. Our red teams using Python, so developers using Python. We see that security is something Python can take account and uh, also in the web frameworks of Python. So it's, yes. So you mean no? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yes, it's Python is more secure than more ours. secure. All right. Yeah, so uh, I, I do think Python is more secure. Like if we have several tools that alert us on vulnerabilities in our code base, and I actually don't remember like a big Python vulnerability in the last year or so in our uh, code base, but I do remember like at least two uh, in Java. 
And whenever we do have a vulnerability in Python, it's like it's pretty much my, way easier to just mitigate it than in other languages and packages. I think that the, one of the benefits of Python is the community. And that's what you guys are talking about. Uh, the frameworks and the libraries are always updated and pe people are very uh, security uh, oriented. Uh, in Bluevine specifically, we are a SaaS company. And from this uh, point of view, I'm less thinking about Python in the security point. I'm more thinking about how do I wrap the services, you know, how do I uh, verify that even the, if the code is have vulnerability or something like that, how do I uh, check the network and and uh, and the way that I can communicate with the service, so that will be more secure. So I think the the most problematic part of security are the people, not the language, <laughs> and, and I think the. The community, as Leo said, uh, has some tendency to, to look at security and, and think about it. So in this aspect, I think Python is better. Well, cannot agree more. I think in security, the, the main issue is people. It's not the programming language. So you need the security audit. You need security expert for your code when you develop it. And of course, test it later. Uh, I'm in storage. I've seen users do really bad security practice, like uh, public buckets that open to everyone and stuff like that. Encryption doesn't help in that case. So I don't think it's, uh, it's the language, but the development practices. It's hard to add after all this wisdom, uh, but stick to popular packages, stick to where the community is working, where you get lots of comments and questions, implement what you need in the CI pipeline, and even if it's part in the Republic on the safe side. And, and that leads us straight into the next question. Perfect uh, lead-in for me there, uh, Michael. Um, do you have a standard way of deciding which Python packages to use? Does it have to be well-maintained? There's a lot of vaporware out there. Somebody wrote something once in 1997, and uh, it's insecure, and it's got a lot of bugs, and it probably has my name on it somewhere. Uh, would you use that package, or how do you go about deciding uh, what to use? Well, probably what, what everyone are doing. Look uh, how many stars it gets on GitHub. Look if the, I, I really like to, to sometimes ask a question if see what comments I get and how fast I get. So even if it's not a popular project, if you're looking for the buzz, you can see if there's someone serious behind it. Uh, you can even sometimes follow the, the founding team of the project and to see what's the background. Um, but usually stick to what's popular, stick where lo lots of commits were done lately. And uh, uh, you have also open, open databases to, to search for security vulnerabilities. You can watch what happened in that project if you really are going for the safe side. As a follow-up to that, before you give away the microphone, so programmers often don't look at things from a very high-level perspective. They look at things as, I want to get the job done. And I saw on Stack Overflow that if I use this pip install something, then it will do what I need. Do you have any protections against that? Uh, well, th there are some tools implemented in the CI pipeline. I think it's it's mostly culture. Uh, it's mostly educating from from the the juniors from the very first days that security is par part of our job. It's part of how we write code and the hazard that comes with it. Uh, so awareness, culture, and obviously some automated tools. All right, thank you, Orit. Same question, starting from the first question and the lead-in. Yeah. So we are. Uh, yeah. I, I'm involved in open source, so in open source, basically the community, someone decided to use a package and everywhere. So it's mostly popularity and the fact that there is community behind the package, it's maintained, and otherwise we won't be able to put it in our project. And for the product, we basically have a security team that does audits, and if there's a package that is unsecure, uh, we they will probably tell us and actually recommend uh, to replace it. Uh, so again, culture and making sure uh, you actually look not just what's, what is uh, hyped, but what uh, can be useful and purpose of it's very important. Uh, the fact there will, stay, there will be community and we won't be left with the packets that won't be maintained. Thank you. 
Uh, this reminds me of a joke that there is about databases, that uh, there are tools. The first rule is it takes about seven years to get to a production-ready database. And the second rule is that there's no exceptions for the first rule. So I'm using old packages, one that have been around for a while, uh, been tested, even if it's not the, the new and shiny toys. Um, that's usually my rule of thumb. Uh, so I think uh, in this sense, uh, Python Zen helps uh, quite a lot in the sense that the, there's a right way to do things according to to Python Zen. And, and, and there's the Java way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, and, um, and what I think we all see is that um, the community gravitates into very few uh, or several uh, very well-maintained focused projects. Uh, that are doing things uh, very well. Uh, so I think that's one part of uh, the answer. The other part is um, the standard library is huge. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, I'm continuing to discover new things there. And um, so you don't have to all, all the time rely on, on third party um, or open source small libraries. So, Everything that uh, everybody said, the, the only small note that uh, I want to add is, first thing, I like to, to ask questions. You know, if somebody wants to add uh, pandas to do something that uh, 10 uh, lines of uh, code can just solve, you need to ask the questions. Sometimes it's better just to implement some, something sim uh, simple uh, instead of bringing a big uh, library or something like that. But except for that, check if you already have a library that do the same thing or something very similar. Check uh, stars, how much uh, issues, if you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, code that being updated in, uh, in the package, basically. So since this is being recorded and my CISO might uh, watch it, uh, the <laughs> first thing we do when we use a new package is check for security vulnerabilities, <laughs> right? And then we check for the, like, for the licensing. Okay, seriously though, uh, <laughs> as everyone said, use uh, like packages from known companies or individuals and not from all kinds of like sketchy people from all kinds of like uh, dark corners of the internet. Um, and I think that the main thing that I'd like to do is, since it's open source, just dive into the code a bit when we, I see a new package and, and get the gist of what's happening there. And uh, that's what I encourage the developers to do as well. Uh, don't use things blindly from Stack Overflow because uh, things will break. Um, yeah, and we have the, all the shiny uh, security tool, tool set that's supposed to protect us when something is uh, entering the code base right before it's merged, etc. Since I am a security company, we are looking at two things. Uh, one of them is security-wise. It's easy when it's a 10K uh, stars uh, package, but once it's uh, 200, you need to dive uh, deeper. So the things that I'm looking at, the, it's uh, how many commits is done in the past month, or if it's maintained, if the test pass, and how many really stars it exist. Uh, then we dive inside the, the, the package itself to see if there is common uh, vulnerabilities or something like this. Uh, and then you need to ask the question, why I need it? So. If an example, like you said, with the pandas, and really need it for that job, and maybe there is something less stars, but it's uh, better for what I need. So these uh, things I need to consider when I ch choosing package or choosing uh, what need to be installed on uh, my system. Thank you. And I was, I was talking to Lior last night about the talk that I gave in 2015. I'm sure all of you remember it. Uh, on how to use meta classes. Uh, and black magic in your um, uh, Python projects and why it was so much fun. Um, what do you think about using Python black magic and behind the scenes coding in order to get things done where when you look at the code, it's very difficult to actually understand what it is doing? It's fun for seniors and uh, hell for juniors just to see you. What the hell I'm looking at, just one line, what did this one line do? It? But it's good when you understand it and it's bad when you don't understand. 
Yeah, so I'm really fond of readable code, and uh, I think that all those magic uh, methods should be used pretty carefully. And uh, like, if we're talking about real life uses, most people don't really look into that and just assume things happen. Uh, I think like the only person in the company that is actually reviewing my black magic things is the Alon that's sitting there and then like pointing me to meta classes and stuff. Um, yeah, so let's try and be explicit about what the code does first and then use magic if we need. <laughs> you can say it. Okay. Black magic and meta classing and stuff like that is great. It's great when you want to learn in your own time. It's great when you need to write a, a framework. For example, the ORMs in uh, Django. When you are at work, don't do it, okay? Nobody will understand the code. Even if somebody is checking your code, after a while, he may not be in the company or you won't be in the company. The code will be not simple. Nobody will understand it. Just keep it simple. Yeah, so I totally agree. Unless, um, as a company, you're building a framework or some special technology, and that's your focus and your your business, then then keep away from it. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of the uh, open source frameworks uh, do do have some of this black magic, uh, but. Um, it, it allows uh, engineers from all all different levels of, of uh, knowledge and so on to to get into to get into this um, to get into our source without diving into this black magic. So, uh, like same in twenty five years of using Python almost daily, uh, I never wrote a meta class to production. Uh, I wrote once a descriptor and deleted it a week later. <laughs> So I agree with everyone. Um, open source, we do lots of code reviews. You can't agree with everyone. Some people said they were great, and other people said don't use them ever. Well, they last uh, <laughs> <a> few months. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, readability of code is very important. Maintainability. Um, contributors comes and go, uh, and they are from all the levels. You cannot assume everybody is senior, and even seniors uh, don't remember what to do what you before I can say for myself. So it's better to keep it simple, readable, and maintainable. Well, it's hard to be last. Um, <laughs> I think the, the only times you you maybe have to implement something of the of the dark side, have a, have a solid plan how to, to get out of there in a, in a few months. That's not something you wanna, even if it's working, it will work for a while, everybody will leave, some you people will join, and then uh, it will take over. Thank you. So when I was doing that, uh, I, I wrote tel uh, telemetry before telemetry was a thing because I wanted to know who was using uh, functions that uh, were in the library uh, and what the use cases were. And so I set it up so that every time somebody would call a function, it would uh, log it to the server. Um, and then no matter what function you wrote as part of the class, it would automatically do it. Uh, I thought it was very, very cool. Some of my users was ups were upset about privacy concerns. Uh, and so when they found out that I was doing that, uh, they raided my office and uh, then we took it out. Um, what do you think about uh, code readability or Python standards is probably a better way of doing it. Uh, to do things Pythonic, you know, sometimes you'll get a developer who starts writing things in camel case or wants to understand how to do an abstract class in Python or things like that. How do you deal with things like that? Do you think that's important or as long as the code works and is readable, it should be allowed in? So yeah, it's super important, obviously. Um, especially it, it, it's, being being felt when the, the organization at large code has to be shared across multiple teams so it's better to to try to keep as most of the the developers you can not talking about only a specific team under a single standard or common standards uh, i think also other tools outside of the code is something that's very helpful for us to, to implement a culture on python proper documentation it's not only in the code it's a part of the ecosystem using cookie cutters templates how to make the code accessible to people, how people 
uh, on board to projects. That, that I think is a key aspect of how making a successful project, external or internal. So coding standards are important. Uh, you have large project, large, many contributors. You have to have coding student standards. Um, it's important for code reviews, simplify them. If you can automate them for every pull request, that's even better. Uh, I'll take a different view on, on being conform with, with coding standard is that they actually really help when doing code reviews because the diffs are about um, content. They're not about someone changing how they indent things or how they move things. So you don't get a lot of uh, noise inside these diffs. Yeah, so I'll try to add to that. I'll say that um, I think the, the main driver is, is, of, is uh, the ability to uh, knowledge share across uh, developers, teams, and, and, and beyond. <laughs> and um, so at the company level, consistency is, is, is an important fa uh, fact, but obviously uh, they able, uh, being able to use um, outside uh, open source libraries and, and, and so forth, uh, the, the, um, the standardization, the Python standardization provides us uh, additional benefits. So when you have a company, it's, it's important that you will have a guiding, uh, styling guide, right? So everybody will write the same uh, kind of code and everybody will understand each other. Doesn't matter if it's uh, PEP8 or something else. Uh, PEP8, the pros for it, you don't have to write the, com uh, the computation, you already have one. If you are using a lot of open sources, they're in PEP8 as well. So it's easy to jump to the code and understand what is going on there. But in general, the most important th uh, thing is that everybody will have the same uh, standard. So I, I think that standards are, like we have the guidelines, right, of how we want the code to, uh, to, to look like, what we want, uh, how do we want to structure things, stuff like that. And we have the standards that are just sort of arbitrary. And I think that like in VI we grew pretty quickly and then uh, like every different team or group cre started creating their own con conventions and they deferred. And there are like pros and cons for each one of them. And I think that, that like we, we need to focus on the crux of the matter and, and say that like we need to follow the same guidelines more than we need to uh, limit the exact number of characters per line. Um, which I, I actually saw people argue about if it should be 88 or 90 and seriously. So the guidelines are the important part. Code style is very important. When you see people that are writing Java and Python, that's frustrating. You cannot read it. Why, why the indentation? Why, why all the changes? You see the code review, it's all green because of the changes. So keep code style very simple. And then, you need to structure more than a structure your code style. You need to structure your project right. When the project right, structure right, you can read more of the code and focus more on what the code is does and not what, how it's look. So keep the code style, even that people come, came from other languages, even the seniors. The most uh, hard part is to teach seniors that came from Java or C sharp to start with Python to forget the whole habits. So you need to focus on the code style. Don't uh, the client on the PRs keep it and go to be more simple. I can see it from uh, front end guys they're using different tools. When you see a code review on 20 pages, all indentation, it's crazy. So keep it simple. See that the only the code change and that's it. One, one second. So I have a follow up question about that. The fact that nobody here mentioned black, what does it mean? Anyone? What is black, Mickey? Black is a tool that automatically indents Python code. Just Python. <laughs> <laughs> it is published by the PSF uh, as the tool for uh, indenting Python code. 
Very cool. So I remember the first code that I committed at Red Hat, where I worked uh, for the past seven years until I recently left. And uh, it got rejected by code review because there were 82 characters. And some of you laugh and others are looking going like, what? Right. So that was my opinion. It was I did not understand what the whole 80 character thing was. Uh, and I wanted to punch the guy. I didn't. Um, and in the end, I did conform and start writing it for 80 characters because he refused to uh, commit my code. Um, but, but on that question, where do you stand on code review? Like, obviously, code review is very important. But how strict do you have to be on code review? Uh, you know, if somebody wrote the wrong uh, length something or the wrong uh, style, is that something that you're going to, you know, go ping pong four or five times? Or are you just going to let that slide and, like, explain to him for the next time? Say that I'm very strict is going to be funny because my guy sees upstairs, they're going to be saying, ah, sometimes it's slight stuff. So you need to focus on the really important things. If you can slide something and do it later, so choose if it's important or not and do it later or not. But focus on the mo most of the parts that has been crucial. For example, if you need to, to refactor huge code, don't do it later, do it now. If you need to teach somebody that changes style. It's gonna be painful right now, but it's gonna be easy later. So focus on that and don't pass them on the way. So uh, I'm continuing with my previous answer about guidelines, and I think we need to focus on the, uh, you know, the flow, the readability, understanding what's happening there, and less about the uh, like specific identity or, or comas and where were they added. Um, I do add nitpicks, like if I have a comment that uh, is explicitly a nitpick, I say it and, and say that you can fix it, but please try to do it different the next time um, and, and try and focus on the, on the main parts of the code. So at Bluevine, remember, we are a bank in the end of the day. Uh, if you write a bug, it, will be, it can be something not uh, critical, or it can be something that costs a lot of money, okay? So styling guide, we have automation. Uh, unit test, we want to verify that you have as much as possible uh, coverage. The, the code review is more business logic, verifying that what you wrote, what the, the other person wrote is makes sense, and it's part of what you want to do. And the second thing is simple, visibility. So everybody will understand the code. I'll continue on that. So I'll say I totally agree that uh, code review, I think, is mostly for uh, the business logic uh, review. Um, coding and styling and so on you should, you know, should be caught in, in the CI or in, in other automation tools. So. I think it's uh, important to remember that the goal of the code review is to get this feature or bug fix to production and not to be right. So focus on that. So I'm going to repeat. Um, yeah, code install, all those should be automated. I do lots of code reviews. I don't want my time to be spent on uh, tabs and length of lines. And um, we do prefer to do, if it's a complex feature, we prefer to do the code, basically the design as a PR also in the code. And, but small fixes, it's about logic, it's about readability, because if I re review the code and I cannot understand it, it means that other may not understand it as well. So we maybe need to write it in a way that everybody understand it. And of course, testing CI to make sure the logic is correct, because it's still, uh, you need I think, in addition to what everybody said, the, the code review is a part of a process. I mean, for, from my perspective, the code reviews that went really bad are those that usually the, the, either the product requirements were not clear enough, uh, um, the technical design was not in, uh, specific enough. So yeah, we found it in the code review, which is, which is great because fixing it in production is way, way worse, but uh, it's usually a part of the process. So, and again, mostly, I. I, I I agree with what everyone said. The only thing that sometimes I like to do is if if I see a comment that really I would have done it different and and 
I know we need to deliver. I will say, I won't leave a comment. Fix it later, consider, open a Jira kit ticket, put it in the backlog so nothing will be, uh, will be forgotten. And that's how, how we can uh, keep a follow-up on the code review, even if it was delivered, not in the, in the perfect standard. All right, after this question, we're gonna ask the, uh, the audience if they have any questions. We'll probably take uh, two or three, depending on the questions and how long they take. Oh. Yeah, I have a comment about open source and code review. So unlike in a company, when you say, I'll do it later, you know, it's in the Jira ticket and someone will do it. In open source, many cases, people contribute the features and disappear. So you cannot tell them, do it later. You will be the one who do it later. So we usually are more strict. It means that if something is not written correctly, it should be rewritten, we'll, be, we'll insist. It sometimes lo looks like nitpicking, but it's experience, because usually we'd say, do it later, it means, you will do it later, and not the one who's submitting the code. All right, um, we're gonna move off of Python specifically now and, and ask more of a general question. We've got here programmers of all levels, all different areas, um, and everybody obviously wants to advance in their career. Uh, some people maybe wanna move into management, some people wanna become architects or, or super senior coders. Uh, what advice can you give to the general audience as a whole as to what they should focus on? Uh, keep studying all the time. Keep, uh, keep exploring, go to meetups, read, read what's hot, experiment a lot. Uh, don't focus only on code. They would do a lot of, everybody are, are doing some infrastructure, some, some enter their own DevOps to some level, uh, uh, spread also outside of code. And, and I think once you get the full picture of how code works, how the ecosystem works, you get to a more uh, uh, mature place and you, you can advance to, again, in any, any path you want, management, tech leading. Excellent advice. Yeah, so it's not all about code and technology. It's, there's lots of things that are soft skill, communication, uh, presentation, how to present an ID. As a, a senior individual contributor, I need many time to present a design. So it's not about code, it's presenting. Um, it's very important to be nice to everyone. You don't know when you're gonna need them later. And um, yeah, and uh, also it's, it's, I think here we are in a conference about Python, but uh, basically it's good also to learn uh, basic concepts and so it's easier to move to different technologies. Uh, it's, it's the concept, it's not just the language and the exact technology. So never stop learning, uh, try to experiment, even sometimes at the cost of uh, what you think is a career goal or, or something else and always try to be the most stupid person in the room um so i'll be a bit contrarian here maybe uh in the sense that i think uh, at the beginning of uh, of your career you should uh focus on a specific environment and i'll call it an environment and not a, a programming language as uh, um, each program language has a complete sort of tooling set, open source environment, and, and so on. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's very important to hone, hone in on, on this total environment first. Uh, I think in that sense, Python is, uh, is a great place to be in as it has a wide variety of uh, um, areas to, to grow into if it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the list here, the agenda here is, is huge, so obviously, uh, um, but start in becoming an expert in, in one environment that obviously will uh, um, assist a lot in once you want to look into other sort of uh, different environments. So there's a couple of aspects here. Uh, if you are junior, start, just starting, learn. Learn as uh, much as possible. Uh, go to conferences, go to meetups, your own time. Uh, start uh, open source or uh, go to famous open sources and try to fix bugs. Uh, a lot of people feel that to, to grow, you need to become a team leader or management. Uh, it's not like that anymore. 
you can grow as a developer and be an architect and learn and design as long that you are keep learning you can grow a lot uh, a lot of times from management uh, perspective if somebody is coming and saying I want to be a team lead why because I want to grow but uh, you see that this person is more fit to be a leader or have a more technical uh, aspects for the uh, jobs sometimes you know a small team with one or two people can guide the person what is he really wants and and then he and, and the management can can start play with it technical lead versus team lead so I think we're pretty privileged in our uh, profession, and I think the main KPI should be fun. Like, seriously, do oh, what he you took do. mine. <laughs> I think I'm sorry. So I'll change. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, so I think really, like, if you figure out what you enjoy doing, and when you enjoy doing something, you usually do it better, and when you do it better, you also improve, and others see it. And like on the other end of the spectrum, figure out what you're not really enjoying and ask yourself why. Because um, sometimes the things you don't enjoy are just the things you're not good at. And maybe you can improve and then start enjoying them too. So again, the KPI is fun. Yeah. Okay, the first thing for they say juniors keep learn. No, keep ask questions. That's the most important. When you can learn everything, but you need to ask the right question in order to understand what you what you're learning. So in different aspects of your career path, you can choose between uh, divided to two, managing process and managing people. Manage people, it's not managing process. When you're managing people, you need to be, you gotta improve your communication skill, you gotta understand the people. Not always you're focusing on, on the process, but most of the time you're focusing on what you do with the people, because people changing, people keep involving, people change their feelings, their minds, so you need to focus that. When you're managing process, Keep learning the technology. Keep improving your technology stack. Keep improving your understanding on the process. Thank you. So I, first of all, I happen to agree with Oren that uh, nobody in this room comes to work to earn a paycheck. Obviously, the paycheck is very, very important. Uh, but you really have to enjoy what you're doing. And there is so much available in the Python ecosystem or in the whole high-tech ecosystem that if you're not enjoying the, the GUI work, you can go back-end. If you don't like back-end, you can go to data science. If you don't like data science, you can play with security. Uh, there is no end to the amount of different things you can do. You can become a project manager, a product manager, talk to customers if you really hate yourself. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of, of uh, ability. Uh, aside from that, the, the two things that I would say is distinguish yourself. Uh, look at where there's a hole, where there's a need, and try to fill that need and say, I'm the guy who does something. Um, that will cause people to remember you and, uh, and, and enable you to continue. And I fully agree with everybody here. You have to always be learning, whether it's by asking questions uh, or by reading or by testing things out that is critical for all of your careers. Uh, and finally, find a mentor. Uh, people who have a lot of experience love to help unless you find those few people who hate other people and they don't like to help. But everybody else really likes to help. If you ask them for advice, if you ask them uh, you know, to, to, to help you with something, they'll really help you out. Uh, so that's my advice. Uh, now we've got some, some really, really experienced people here on the panel. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? Yeah, so uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, about the packaging. You were talking about uh, not pulling in any random uh, stack overflow pip install something and then it works uh, what do you think about uh, using that for testing purposes so in case of uh, uh, pytest plugins which are maybe maintain barely maintained by some sketchy uh, small uh, library but it helps it helps out at the, uh, and since it's not production code it's just a only it only goes to testing uh, what do you think about that? Another, uh, don't any of you use a black in as part of your CI/CD? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so 
uh, I'll, I'll start with the first question. Um, copy pasting something you saw that runs some kind of code is essentially the same as downloading anything that pops up in your browser and clicking on it. So even if it's only on your machine and only in your isolated environment, I wouldn't recommend doing it without at least trying to understand what's happening there because you know it can do anything. Um, like try to write a keylogger. It's not that uh, that net complicated. Um, and about Black, we do incorporate it now. Like uh, we're actually starting like a, a platform group that uh, will work on all kinds of standardizations. And the argument that I mentioned about 88 or 90 uh, characters per code is the people that are now configuring Black are trying to understand, uh, me included, uh, trying to understand exactly the, those uh, configurations. Um, it is nice. Uh, it is a bit odd that something, like if, if people don't know Black, it's not just uh, a linter. It also reformats your code to match the, uh, the styling guide. Um, it is weird that something is just automatically changing what you just wrote, uh, but uh, I think it's helpful. I would recommend something like that on your local machine and not on the CI environment, because you don't want something to go in the code review that you didn't write. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, when I wrote code, I was a little bit fanatic. Uh, I don't like stuff that writes for me the code. I prefer, you know, if I don't know the styling guide, I will write the code. 90% I will need to refactor. After that, 70%. After that, 20%. And if I won't do it with, with automation, but keep my memory and, and, and used to do it, after a while, after one year, two years, you become, you're just writing the code and it's just like that. Uh, this is something that an automatic tool can't give you. This ability to, to learn and to do it uh, yourself. Uh, about the testing, I recommend something like either use uh, Docker and then you're testing the same environment in your dev, in your CI, in your staging and in production. And even the opposite, you have a bug in production, you're just give, uh, taking the same image to your dev, you can check it, different uh, configuration, of course, but you understand the point. There is a couple of, of uh, tools that you can use to verify that the packages are exactly the same. You can use Docker, you can use your own uh, uh, PyPI uh, uh, service, you can use something like uh, pipenv, that uh, give you a requirements file with lock that you ensure that it's exactly the same. This is a uh, couple tools that you can use. All right, we have time for one more audience question. Jacob. Thank you. Amongst the all of you, you've seen a lot of packages coming in, all sorts of licenses going on. Any licensing issues you ever encounter? And if yes, how do you solve them? So I, I worked at uh, Qualcomm. It's a company that uh, mainly does IP. Uh, and there every, every package you want to use uh, has to go for about three or four lawyers before uh, you can start using it. Uh, sometimes you just don't use the package. Uh, that's it. <laughs> no, no other things. Sometimes we, we wrote some of the functionality on our own. So our, our project, the uh, base project Ceph is GPL. So sometimes packages that are not compatible with GPL are a problem. Um, but uh, we love GPL, I read it. So I'm really a strong believer in GPL. I think it's very important for open source. Um, so that's a consideration. On the other way around, we would never use closed source or any license that is not open source as well. Uh, and just won't use the package, it's not. Don't mess with GPL is what uh, Tal just said. No, I don't think GPL is just that difficult. You need to understand it and not break it, basically. That's very important for open source, but uh, you don't want to mess with them. You want to read the license properly and then use it. Yeah. True of everybody. All right, last question. Hey, um, what do you think about static type checking for Python? 
Um, so I'll take that that one. So um, I think here in the panel, maybe we're the sort of smallest uh, company or so on, and we're growing extensively this past uh, past year. And um, uh, we've started obviously very in a very dynamic form, running as as fast as possible, and. Uh, um, now we're starting to implement static type checking and it's, uh, we're trying to find this balance where it helps us, uh, with the growth of the organization, uh, obviously uh, onboarding, uh, new engineers on, onto the different teams, um, allowing them to have a better grasp of the, of the code. So it has its pros, it has cons, and we're, we're trying to find, uh, the, the sort of, uh, balance there. Uh, personally, I think it's very depends what is the the thing that you want to add the static type uh, for it. If it's a let's say code for a microservice, a specific uh, team, I wouldn't really recommend it because you're taking Python and a little bit removing the agility of it. Uh, if it's a framework or a library that some core team is writing and giving to all the company, it's a great tool. Uh, definitely, like if, if there's a script that I'm writing just for myself to scrape something, to get data out of something, or just I know automate something for myself, then I, I don't bother using uh, typing at all. Uh, but when you start sharing your code and, and there are like, Things that are not that might be ambiguous, like what is this? Like this is ID, okay? This identifier. So, is it a string? Is it an int? Is it something different entirely? And then uh, it really, really helps uh, adding typing and, and static type checks and all that. Don't try to refactor all the project that just to add the type checking, but uh, it also do, don't do it with ORM. You already checked in the DB, already checked in the, 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 the data model fields. But if you write a project that you're gonna give the project to somebody else, so try to edit. If it's a new project, try to edit. Like every new technology, try to adopt it slowly. Don't enforce the old stuff, use a union with list, and then nobody understands why it's that. So easy. All right, thank you. Did you wanna answer that as well? All right, thank you very much, uh, panelists. This is uh, super informative.